there, Extra Historians! Welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you all the things we left out, the stuff we got wrong, and why we often have not enough rifles in our episodes. I'm Rob, I'm the head writer of Extra History, and we're going to be talking about our Sitting Bull series. Uh, Lies is made possible by our patrons who make the entire show possible. Thank you for voting for this, uh, for this series. I think it was a, a really cool thing to cover. Um, if you are not a patron, you can join us on Patreon, you can join our Discord, you can suggest topics, vote on topics, and uh, in general be part of our historical community. Uh, we are a part of the Nebula First program. If you want to go and sign up for Nebula, you can see all our episodes ad-free, and you can also uh, see our episodes a week early. So if you want to see our new Secret Societies, number one, on the cult of Mithras and mystery religions, it's already up there. Recommended reading for this series is The Earth That Is All That Lasts by Mark Lee Gardner, The Last Stand by Nathaniel Philbrick, and three uh, books from Osprey that really helped us design the visual aspects of the series. Little Bighorn 1876 by Peter Panzeri Jr., published by Osprey, Warriors at the Little Bighorn by Richard Hook, and Sioux Warrior vs. U.S. Cavalryman by Ron Field. There are also a lot of uh, academic articles we consulted in this. They are linked below. Um, a lot of the cultural aspects I didn't want to leave up to pop history books, so we, we used a lot of them. So a couple of general things. A lot of people asked a version of, like, why didn't I learn this in school? Well, you probably did, but it was very condensed and not that memorable. Um, one thing that I think is, on one hand, like a strength of the U.S. educational system, but on the other hand a weakness, is how local it can be. So... Uh, Public schools are administered by states, there are federal standards, but, you know, particularly history is going to have components of, like, U.S. history, world history, but, you know, state history. Um, so if you live in Massachusetts, you're going to learn a lot about the Plymouth Colony, and if you live in uh, California, you're going to learn a lot about the gold rush, but, you know, from one hand and the other, like, if you're in Massachusetts, the gold rush might be one page in your textbook and vice versa on the Plymouth Colony, right? So I think that, that people who live in the Midwest actually do get quite a bit of this history in school, but people like me that grew up in Hawaii, I got barely any of it, right? But I did get a ton of Hawaiian history. I, so I, I had indigenous history. It was just a different type uh, that was focused on. I do think we don't have enough indigenous history just in general in schools or even in, in just sort of popular culture. There doesn't seem to be a huge appetite for flocking to it and learning of it, and, which I think is really unfortunate. It's very rich. It's uh, important to understand like where we are now and kind of the consequences of uh, American expansion. But uh, yeah, so I think some people did learn in the school. And I also want to say, I went to high school 20 years ago, so I am not an authority on what is taught now. I have many friends that are teachers. I respect what they do a lot, um, and I would hope things are, are better now. But I suspect it has something to do with where you where you live. Uh, patron question from Hercules. When you're talking about buffalo herds, you should bring up that as part of their war to eradicate the native tribes, the U.S. government encouraged the wholesale slaughter of the buffalo. Um, yeah, I would actually love to do a full series on this topic. We. Uh, if you're a patron, you know that we've had that as an option in our environmental history uh, theme a few cycles ago. Um, the Little Ice Age got picked instead, but I would really like to do the, the slaughter of the American bison. Also really want to do a series on whaling. Badly want to do a series on whaling. Um, but yeah, it was very intentionally to damage Plains tribes. However, there was also a profit motive to, to it, right? Like, um, buffalo pelts could sell for a lot. And uh, so could skulls taken back east, where they're a big novelty. And um, buffalo tongue was considered a delicacy. So it was kind of like shark finning today, right? They'd frequently just shoot a buffalo and cut out its tongue and just leave the rest to, to decay. And just, ah, God, so wasteful and terrible. YouTube question. You should bring up the U.S. government's policies uh, that were officially genocidal, both literally in trying to kill the native tribes, but also culturally, what with the reservations and Indian boarding schools. As one of the racists put it back then, kill the Indian, save the man. Well, if you want to know about that, we actually do already have an episode on Indian boarding schools called Kill the Indian and Save the Man that focuses around that speech and kind of the, the idea for creating these schools and the, the mass amount of damage that they did. Um, 
that's a huge stain, not just on the U.S. government, but also the can Canadian government that um, continued the program for much longer. And also religious organizations, you know, the Catholic Church ran a, a lot, and so did uh, several Protestant denominations. Um, we also had a, an episode on Jim Thorpe recently, who started out at Carlisle Indian Industrial School. So that's like kind of a bright spot in, in that otherwise incredibly horrible history. Uh, episode one. This is a great, very lengthy question from, or a uh, comment from YouTube that I'm going to shorten a little bit. Uh, just a quick note on the use of the lever action Henry rifle in this video, which looks pretty good, by the way. Good job, Nick. Nick did a really great job, uh, our artist on this series, which had a lot of very difficult cultural and technical elements to it. Um, but technically, you probably shouldn't show U.S. troops using them at this time. I think the cavalry was still using some variety of Spencer carbine at this point. But that's a minor detail and isn't a series about the U.S. cavalry. What I think is interesting is by the time of the Battle of Greasy Grass Little Bighorn, the U.S. was issuing single-shot rifles, but the indigenous people had a couple hundred repeating rifles of various models kicking around, Henry's included. Yeah, so this is one of the things that I've discussed before, that for multiple reasons it's difficult to have multiple models of firearms in our, our show. Like, it's difficult for the artists to do, technically, is create multiple assets. It's often hard to tell the difference in our art style. And um, unless the episode really like revolves around that, if I notice that it's wrong, it has there has to be a really compelling version to go back and fix it. In this case, I noticed in episode two, I looked at how much of episode one we would have to redo. It was going to delay episode three. And I just had to say, look, this isn't actually a series about the Battle of Little Bighorn. If it were, we'd have to fix it, because that is an important part of that story. Um, but uh, I think that we need to just, like, move on and I'll discuss it in lies. Um, so that's that's why, because this is, this is a series about Sitting Bull, not about Little Bighorn. One of the ways I wrote this series was to kind of skirt the battle itself, so that we can go back and do a full-on Little Bighorn series. Um, and were we to do that, I would definitely make sure that the, the rifles were correct because we'd talk about we'd talk about that. Someone said at 159 Montana is spelled wrong. I would like to have seen Montana spelled right. To quote Sam Neill. Episode two, patron question by How Sun. Hi, uh, could you talk about how all those shots could have missed Sitting Bull in episode two? My guess is that they were at extreme range. Even with modern rifles, it's really hard to hit a target uh, at 80 to 100 meters with just iron sights. You know, if you don't have a telescopic sight, if the target is not, like, brightly colored, if there are obscuring elements, you know, if someone's up on a hill sitting and you're, like, down in, in a valley and you're shooting at them, that's a real shallow angle to actually hit them. And, you know, even today with, with much better technology, soldiers fire huge amounts of ammunition without, you know, hitting, hitting uh, the person that they're shooting at. Um, calculating how, exactly how many rounds is like kind of a weird little pet thing people try and do on the internet, but the truth is like no one really knows. Um, one number thrown around that I don't think really has much to support it is that like out of every 100 shots fired at Gettysburg, one bullet hits someone. Again, I don't know how you'd even begin to calculate that. Um, but basically, the people that were shooting at him were likely also being shot at by other Lakota warriors that were not taking part in this um, circle with the pipe. So <laughs> um, they're not also just standing like they're at a gun range. Um, they're probably ducking and weaving and trying to stay out of the line and fire themselves. So that's why, I think. Patron question from Flubbadubba. Have there been revitalizations of the bison following traditions the Plains Nations practiced uh, that they had to give up to go on a reservation? I know presently that the bison themselves have become a subject of conservation efforts and also apparently domestication efforts. Um, they were nearly driven extinct in the 19th century. Uh, they only survived because a few private individuals had bison on their land and they allowed them to exist. Um, bison, though, we found do best when they're in herds of a thousand or more. And there are very few of those herds uh, left, even building up the population. You know, the Yellowstone has 4,800. Um, there are a couple of other national parks that have around 1,000. Um, many have less than that. 
if you get under a thousand, then um, inbreeding becomes an issue. Also, bison can breed with cattle, so many have kind of like mixed uh, cattle bison genetics. So one thing that the Department of the Interior now does is genetic testing to kind of separate the bison that have cattle heritage and um, keep the 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 stock that they have what what's called heritage genetics, like Yellowstone heritage gen genetics. And um, they worked with a group called the Intertribal Buffalo Council that uh, basically the Department of Interior will take bison that it has certified have heritage genetics. It'll quarantine them because now bison are getting all these diseases from deer and elk. Um, and then they will give them over to these, these tribes that keep their own uh, buffalo herds. And that will, that helps not only to increase their number of buffalo, but to make sure that the, uh, the breeding stock that is being introduced into that buffalo herd is going to be, is that going to be actual buffalo, not like buffalo cattle hybrid? Um, However, it's an ongoing process. You know, it's 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 better than it used to be, but it's not without its challenges. Great YouTube comment. Give them ears. That's a creepy way to uh, say you're going to kill someone. Um, recently, my wife, who, who has not watched this series, uh, was in the other room with, with my five-year-old, and she wasn't really listening. And she was like, are you not listening? Do you not have ears? Does mommy have to give you ears? <laughs> and... Uh, and it just like purred me up, ah, what? Um, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it really stuck with me too. Uh, even that very innocent interaction like pinged my radar. Like what you're gonna do, what? Um, it also bears mentioning, speaking of uh, bears rib, that some groups like Sitting Bulls that said like, no accommodation with the government, we will not accept annuities, nobody else should accept annuities. Uh, they were not above pressuring people who did accept annuities to give them some of that annuity. Um, so, you know, there there is like a little bit of hypocrisy there sometimes. Um, and apparently Sitting Bull was not himself above this. That he's like, oh, you got an annuity from the government. You know, please give me some as tribute. I mean, living on the plains, people need stuff, Right. But I, I, feel, I just feel really sorry for Bear's Rib. It seems like he was caught in a very impossible situation to navigate. We had a really wonderful comment. It'd be nice if you addressed the uh, relationship with the crow in the subsequent Lies episode. You briefly touched on it twice without really going into, probably because it doesn't fit with the story being told, but it's still important. Yeah, so this is the first series where we are transitioning to a four-episode series arc. We're trying this out for a number of reasons, some of them involving YouTube and how it's changing, um, but also so that I can commission more guest episodes like Transatlantic Cable and Jim Thorpe, um, so I can write more one-offs myself or do two, you know, uh, two-off episodes on things that I think are important but won't fit in a one-off, and um, pursue some like wish list passion episodes, uh, uh, passion project episodes I've had on a a list forever saying like, we should do something about this. I think it would be very cool. I'm still kind of learning what I can fit in four episodes, and especially with this one, because it was the first the first one we transitioned on. We did have more stuff about Battles with the Crow, and uh, particularly an, an incident where Sitting Bull's father, Jumping Bull, is killed, and Sitting Bull pursues a bunch of crow warriors and kind of goes berserk and kills a bunch of them, including some that are like running away from him. Um, and uh, largely that got cut um, for time. This story looks very different from the Crow perspective, right? Like the, the Lakota are going after them all over the place. They're uh, on land that the Crow consider theirs. The Crow end up, you know, allying with the U.S. Cavalry during the Battle of Little Bighorn. So you can absolutely flip this script and, uh, and, and be like, Sitting Bull and Lakota, Lakota are not necessarily the good guys from their perspective, um, or fighting kind of like a righteous conflict. Episode 3, patron question from Flubadubba. Many of the names of the indigenous folks in the story are taken as translated phrases. Are they actually supposed to be understood this way in the Lakota language, or is this an artifact of how settlers and caravan migrants who encountered them came to understand their way of naming themselves? My understanding is that they are well translated. I didn't see anything saying they're not. Um, 
my understanding is they do have these kind of longer names, you know, Buffalo Bull who sits down, goes to Sitting Bull. But uh, having said that, I don't speak Lakota. I am not a specialist in that area. Um, I would say that they are accurate, but grain of salt here. Um, we're always learning new things. Uh, you know, I, I, as from what I've seen, they're accurate, but I, I don't want to like close the door and say 100%. Um, cause I'm, I'm, I, I don't think that I have the authority to do that. Um, and I would be happy if someone told me different. Uh, episode four, patron question from Bo Carey. What is the difference between Manifest Destiny and other forms of conquest in human history? What makes it so morally complex? So Manifest Destiny is a, a belief in a literal divine right, a God-ordained sanction for the United States to spread from the Atlantic to the Pacific, essentially like wherever it can go. So it is not only morally and ethically just for them to push out these indigenous people or get rid of them through extermination or assimilation, um, but it's a moral imperative to do so, that they belong, uh, that this land is has by God been given to um, white Americans. I don't think it's really morally or ethically that complicated looking at it. I mean, when we look at it today, it's like, no, this is pretty bad. But I think it's really important to understand that this was like a permission structure that essentially allowed anything to be done to indigenous people, um, provided it furthered this goal. And uh, I, I do want to, um, I think it's a really crucial thing to understand because you don't want, these kind of thought patterns will like come up again in history. And I, I think it's really important to study when this happened before and what the results were in order that we understand the consequences of following, falling into that kind of thought pattern again, um, of that, that America belongs to a certain kind of people and everyone else just needs to get out of the, get with the program or get out of the way, or you're just going to be crushed. Right. Um, I also think it, it's important to understand that not everyone thought this way or didn't think this way to the same extent is probably the better way of saying it. When there's the uh, ghost dance at Standing Rock and there's the, the standoff, Buffalo Bill was rushing to Standing Rock uh, because he really believed that if he could get there, he could defuse the situation and Sitting Bull would, would be protected. And he got there too late and Sitting Bull was killed. But Buffalo Bill really, really believed that if he had gotten there, he, he could have prevented this from happening. And there, there are people who, when they hear about, you know, massacres of indigenous people, they write letters to the editor saying this is absolutely awful. Um, and in a way that makes it more tragic that there was an understanding that this was wrong. Um, and that, uh, that indigenous people had been treated very badly and had been frequently betrayed, you know, in, in what they were told was going to happen. Um, so I think that's, it, it is a sort of special thing that you see in American culture. Um, and it, it is a, a very negative and bloody legacy. YouTube question, it's generally assumed that when Sitting Bull said he wanted his people to learn to read, he assumed they'd be taught to read and write in Lakota language, not English. Actually, this isn't this isn't a YouTube question. This is a, something I put in to talk about. Um, yeah, I read this in several uh, uh, books. I think this is pretty likely. Uh, a big thing during the 19th century were particularly missionaries creating written languages for indigenous uh, oral uh, languages that were on the, on the oral that had no written uh, language system. And this was usually to aid conversion, but could very quickly be turned around and used to like perpetuate, continue to perpetuate um, indigenous culture. So probably that's what Sitting Bull had in mind when he says, I want my people to be able to read and write. Um, but you know, it very quickly becomes clear they're only being taught to read and write in English. Um, so it's one of a number of disappointments that, that Sitting Bull uh, comes comes to uh, see when he's at, at Standing Rock.
Uh, you mentioned that Sitting Bull's people, the Hunk Papa, who fled, joined the Cheyenne fleeing to Pine Ridge. The group they joined was Minikoju, one of the four bands of Lakota that today make up the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, not the Cheyenne Tribe. Thank you for that clarification and for writing. Uh, and finally, Annie Oakley's father died when she was six. The cigarette shooting trick was done with her husband, Frank Butler. Uh, this is correct. I just misremembered. Coming up on Extra History, uh, we have Secret Societies in the Shadows, Hypatia of Alexandria, A Martyr for Knowledge, The Invasion of Canada, The Battle for Quebec. I'm writing those now. They're a lot of fun, um, especially all the Benedict Arnold stuff. He's a really cool uh, and interesting historical character. And we are currently voting on a uh, the theme of Rise to Power. So it's sort of the origin story of a historical figure or movement. And I just wanted to take us out with Ibn Battuta's side trip. I'm very interested in things like fairground displays and uh, displays of human oddities and things like that. I think it's a really interesting window into culture. It's something that uh, I, I helped TA a class in when I was in college, actually. Um, and part of these Wild Westing shows, like, were very similar in, 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 a, in the vein of anthropological displays um, of the Victorian era, which frequently were pitched as educational, but actually there was some other element, whether it was violence or action or uh, nudity, you know, that was trying to kind of draw the masses in and ride this line between something that was supposedly teaching you something, but was actually had this other purpose, whether it was, you know, um, titillation or excitement or whatever. And I don't think this has really gone away with, with the, the Old West, quote unquote. The American West continues to be something that we return to f for tales of adventure or a sense of excitement. I mean, you, you can literally go to wild, still go to wild westing shows. I mean, but uh, I really think a lot about um, Disneyland. If you follow me on Twitter, which I don't necessarily recommend because it means you have to be on Twitter, um, which is pretty much always a bad choice, you'll know that I really, really love Disneyland. I take my kids all the time to Hong Kong Disney. And like, even at Hong Kong Disney, there is a Wild West themed park called Grizzly Gulch, which is supposedly like a California gold mining town in 1888. There is no depiction of any Native Americans there. Um, when the reason they did that is because there's a long history of depictions of Native Americans and, and indigenous people at Disneyland from its opening in the 1950s um, all the way to today. They've, they've always had a, you know, quote unquote, Indian village and kind of efforts to make it more educational and more correct um, have continued to meet with controversy because, you know, in, in the beginning there were like dances and there were live performers and then it moved to animatronics or just like an empty village. And um, it's, it's difficult that like we continue to kind of use the American West as this imaginative setting for adventure, but we can't really figure out how indigenous people fit into that anymore. And a lot of times now they're just removed, which is also not a good choice. So I, I think it's an interesting thing that like we keep struggling with this legacy of, uh, of what was done to indigenous people during this period in time that we tend to lo also look at very nostalgically um, and kind of will present in like an educational way, but like along with the education is the sense of like excitement and adventure. And I don't know, it's a it's a really interesting question. Like how how we're going to thread that needle or ever, if we ever really can. Um, so it's something I think about a lot. So thanks a lot. I'll see you next time. See, did you hear the one about Kuya Koi, Joseph Blame, Izzy Coin, Ilkner, Dominic Valenciana, Arclight Games, Angela Valenciana, and Ahmed Ziad Turk being legendary patrons? Yeah, turns out they're the best. 